Right. And um, yeah, so now there's another metric that we uh, focus on very much. And again, this is kind of the Canadian real estate market and U.S. real estate market is the rent to value ratios. Um, um, so in the U.S., they have this uh, this kind of uh, metric, this is kind of a concept of one percent rule where um, your your month's rent should equal close to or at um, one percent of your asset value. So currently on the deals that you're looking at and advising and educating your students on, what is that rent to value ratio? And again, just to give you a Vancouver perspective, <laughs> our rent to value ratios here are 0.2% uh, to 0.3% kind of approximate kind of number. So you're in extreme negative cash flow. So talk to us about the rent to value ratios that exist on deals you're looking at. In the U.S. Yeah. In the US. In the US. Uh, yeah, in the U.S., there's markets that we can actually not only satisfy the one percent rule. There's actually some markets we can satisfy the two percent rule if you want it. However, really? wow. so if you want it, now I'm gonna I'm gonna put a big <laughs> asterisk next to that and say just because you can doesn't mean you should. Right. And so what that means when you have a very high amount of rent relative to purchase price, that usually signifies you have a really bad economy because if somebody knows that hey, I could own this house for less than renting it why wouldn't they own it? And that usually means that the economy is not good and people aren't able to keep jobs. Uh, and usually it, it uh, will find the places that satisfy that are typically places with shrinking populations where people are moving away. And so I'll use Detroit as an example where I made a big mistake early on in my US career and I bought three properties there and never again. Uh, so I used to look at it as the homes are so cheap, how can you possibly screw up? Well, how you screw up is that once you buy the property, well, it's not just the purchase price, but now you are responsible, of course, with ownership comes liability. And so when you're, when you're in a place with a really bad economy, what I found out, I had three different properties in three different parts of town. They weren't close to each other. All three of them were constantly getting vandalized. People were stealing copper and they were still, they were stealing, I was gonna say everything that wasn't nailed down. They were stealing things that were nailed down. Wow. So when, when you have a, a lot of people that don't have work, they have to turn to some sort of way to get money and it turns out they like to steal things. And so, um, so quite often when you stick to that 1% rule, it's gonna lead you down a rabbit hole. It takes you to the wrong market. So I'm gonna teach you how I pick a market just really briefly because I, I, sure. I have a really long presentation on this, but I won't Please. I know in, in interest of time. But the first thing you wanna look at when you pick a market, most people don't even think about this. You wanna go to a place where it's tenant, or sorry, where it's landlord friendly and not tenant friendly. So in, in the States, uh, if you look at a place like California, you could, if you had a tenant that wasn't paying rent and was trashing your place, it can take you over a year to get rid of them. So you want to be really careful with that. That's the number one thing. Because if you buy in a market where your tenant can stay a long time, I can guarantee you your, your mortgage company is not going to say, oh, well, I see you got a bad tenant. We feel bad for you. Don't, don't pay us. You don't have to pay us till you start getting rent. They, that will never happen in a million years. So you're still responsible for your mortgage payment property taxes, insurance, that doesn't stop. Those bills keep coming in when you're not having any cash flow. So pick a market that's landlord friendly. I love Atlanta, which is where I sell my turnkey properties. Uh, uh, we can usually get rid of a bad tenant within three weeks, sometimes quicker. And uh, it's very, very business friendly there. Number two thing you should look at, and this is how I created my wealth, is to look at what are the chances of appreciation. And appreciation is one of the biggest things that cause appreciation is simple supply and demand. So if you wanna uh, make a lot of money, figure out where people are moving to and start buying there before they figure out in their mind that that's where they're moving to. And so with COVID, what we're, we're seeing some new trends emerging that have never really been there before. Like a lot of people doing business over Zoom now and realizing I don't have that commute to the office anymore. So if you can get further from the city center, usually you're gonna get a lot more house, a lot more land uh, for a lot, uh, a lot less money. And people are willing now to be further from the city center because that job isn't bringing them there anymore. So people aren't necessarily going to the city center and they're also leaving places. Where are they leaving? They're leaving places that are, are unaffordable. If you lose your job and you, uh, you're living, I'll use Vancouver, you're living in Vancouver and you don't have a job, uh, your lifestyle is not very sustainable for very long there. So where are you going to move? You're going to go somewhere cheaper with a lower cost of living and where there's jobs. And so uh, Atlanta, is a place where the government isn't just landlord friendly, but they're very business friendly. And they give a whole bunch of tax incentives for businesses to open up shop there. So if we look at uh, Atlanta's head office, Coca-Cola, Home Depot, Turner Broadcasting, Delta Airlines, the list goes on and on and on. And the most, and actually um, 
Uh, Microsoft just announced that they're making that one of their hubs and they're bringing in, in the short term 9,000 jobs. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of businesses like to go there because they don't pay very much tax and the government's smart because they know, hey, if we give these businesses some tax breaks, they're going to bring in a bunch of employees and we can tax them. And so, but that's good news for us as landlords because we know that if our uh, tenants lose their, let's say we know that Delta Airlines, which has their head office in Atlanta, we know that the airlines are going to be struggling for the next little bit. Well, if you got laid off at Delta, you can go work for Coca-Cola or Microsoft or a host of all those other companies that have their offices there. So uh, if, if we contrast that with, we'll use Detroit again, because I'm, I'm, I still have very bitter memories. Uh, if we contrast, it with, contrast that with Detroit, well, Detroit's known for the auto industry. And the auto industry is probably, there's not a lot of people losing jobs thinking, you know, I should really buy a new car right now. There's not a lot of that. And in addition to that, cars are not going to look the same as they have in the past. The, the big leaders in the car industry are going to be like Apple and tech companies, Uber. Uh, it's going to be way different. It's not going to be Ford, Chrysler, GM. They're, they're old school cars. New school cars are, are self-driving, self-flying. Uh, who knows what they're going to do, but they don't look like the stuff that's coming out of Detroit right now. And so that city hasn't really reinvented itself. And you can certainly fit the 1%, 2% rule there. Same with Buffalo. There's a bunch of cities I could list off, mostly in, in uh, the, north, uh, the northern U.S., uh, and people are leaving there in droves. So yeah, in theory, you can get great returns on your rent. That's the third thing we look at. Number two is appreciation. Number three is the returns. How hard is your money going to work for you where you're holding that property? But if you focus on that, that's where most people go first and you pick the wrong market, you're going to get what I call paper returns. On paper, it's going to look awesome. In reality, you're going to have very high vacancy because people will pay the first month's rent, maybe the second month, and then they don't have a job. Where's that money coming from to pay you? They can't. So you're going to have a hard time evicting them because they've got no place to go. And uh, once that home is vacant, it's going to get vandalized. Like every second day, you're going to get your, the police are going to be there. They don't even go there anymore. But you're going to have nonstop headaches. So, so I would say don't focus strictly on the 1% rule until you look at those first other two things first and then look at the returns you're going to get. And so a lot of the markets right now that are really good and really solid are more, they become appreciation plays because we know that people are going to head there looking for jobs, looking for lower cost of living. So if we look at, uh, I'll use California, everybody's leaving California right now. And they're going, uh, in, uh, in the West, they're heading to places like Phoenix, smaller extent Vegas, uh, a lot of the Texas markets, and Idaho of all places. I don't, I don't think I could leave the beaches of California for Idaho, but that's just me as a Canadian who heads very far south to be near the water. But, um, but you have to look at where the trends are and be ahead of the game. And in, in the East, a lot of people are moving to places like Atlanta where there's jobs and low cost of living. And so I, I would never want to give up that appreciation to make an extra few hundred bucks a month in rent. If I can, like, it's kind of funny. I had a Facebook memory pop up a few weeks ago and it was a property that I, I promoted on my Facebook page that was 105,000 in Atlanta one of my turnkey properties eight years ago, that property is now, is now probably worth around 350000 Now, if I would have picked a property in Detroit instead, try to fit that 1% rule, I, I'd be, I don't think there'd be any appreciation. And I'd be very lucky if my cash flow didn't get all eaten up by uh, renovations and the, from the vandalism and from the vacancy. So you have to, so I just want to really clarify that because so many people get caught up in these 1% rules, all these things. Yeah. In a, in, in a perfect world, that would be awesome. In a perfect world that existed. And there was a point where Atlanta did satisfy that. But right now you're, you're probably honestly going to get, if you're holding a property in Atlanta, you're probably, because the market's gone up a lot and the rents haven't quite caught up yet, but they will. Uh, you're going to get probably half that. You're going to get maybe 5% to 6% per year. But the bigger part of that picture is that market is going up very, very quickly. And there's homes, my, my cheapest home right now for sale, I think is $90,000. So that's not even a shed in uh, Vancouver or Calgary or any, any Canadian city for that matter. Just to focus uh, on, on, on Atlanta. So if, if, if you have a, an, an interested investor currently to buy a, a, a property in Atlanta through, through what the services you offer and from the rents they would collect, uh, first of all, what is kind of a conventional mortgage that they could get? What would, what would a down payment be? What is the LTV? What is a down payment they need to put as a Canadian citizen buying a place in Atlanta today? Yeah, so if you're a Canadian citizen, uh, most of the banks uh, in the U.S. are moving target. And right now, since COVID, not, not really very many of them are lending to foreign nationals, unfortunately. Once again, that's the moving target. So by the time you watch us, everything could shift. We never know. 
But uh, for Canadians, uh, your best options are one, look at uh, RBC. They have both uh, Canadian and US branches. We've had pretty good success with them. And they're a bit of a moving target. I think I've had some students and clients uh, purchase with 25% down in the past. Last I heard it was 40, but once again, that number changes. Sure. Uh, with RBC, let's, say, let's say 35% down through RBC, let's say on a hypothetical. Now, from the rents they collect on that property, would they be positive cash flow, negative cash flow? Would, would they break even? And what is the target? What is kind of the thesis? Yeah, well, you, you should be able to get with the, uh, with the current rates easily some positive cash flow. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the target right now, and, and, and this is what I recommend for most investors that are just starting out, is to really focus on getting big appreciation. Even if I could break even on a property cash flow wise in the short term, if I know that I can uh, be in a market that ha for every, I mean, there's, there's no reason why people are not going to move to a place that's creating lots of employment. That's, that's first and foremost on a lot of people's mind right now. It's like, okay, I lost my job or I lost my business. I've got to start over. Where can I afford to do that? I can't, stay, if, you're, if you're living in midtown Manhattan paying 5,000 a month for a one bedroom apartment, when you had your job, that might have been sustainable. Right now, for a lot of people, you're going to burn through your savings if you have any very, very quickly. And people aren't aren't uh, panicking yet because the, the there's that foreclosure moratorium. There's uh, there's you know, an eviction moratorium, so people aren't panicking. But like I said, this is all going to shift, and and people are going to have to make some pretty big choices. And in the U.S., I find much more so than Canadians, people are wanting to relocate in search of jobs. Like people will move very quickly and, and people also get on this uh, tangent like in California right now that's all everybody talks about oh the taxes here suck so bad they should try living in Canada but anyway that's all everybody's talking about so that's why they're moving to Texas Texas there's no state income tax so that's why they want to go there they want the opposite of what they've got so people will, will often uh, get on this bandwagon where, and, and I think a lot of those people move to Texas will eventually move back not there's anything I'm not putting down Texas there's some nice cities there but Anyway, a lot, a lot of people make these rash decisions when things, there's a little bit of pressure on. So you wanna be in the path of progress and they leave. And you also wanna consider, well, where are they leaving? Is that market eventually gonna come back again? And I think for the US, people that are leaving, especially the Northern cold places that look a lot like Canada in the winter, there, there's a trend in general, even before COVID of people heading from North to South. And uh, we have all these baby boomers retiring, where are they gonna to go to? They're heading to the South, to the south not to the North. And so you just have to be uh, keeping in, in front of all these trends. But going back to the, the returns, uh, right now, in all honesty, that market is going up very, very quick. Rent will be going up very, very quickly uh, shortly. And so you only have to buy the property once. That rent is, is going to go and keep pace as the property prices go up. It just hasn't hit yet. There's a lot of people aren't, they're kind of staying put right now while things unfold with COVID. As that, as that shifts, we're going to see a massive increase in rent and that those numbers will go up. But in the meantime, you can capture that appreciation play. And right now, as I look back, when I was younger, if I had made more decisions around, okay, I want more cash flow, doing that right out of the gate, ha having an extra 100 or 200 bucks won't change your life. Having that extra 100,000, 200,000, 500,000 appreciation will allow you to buy more properties, which will in turn give you more cash flow, which will in turn change your life. But you have to do things in the right order. And to me right now, unless if, if you call me up and you say, hey, Mike, I've got $2 million in my bank account. I want a, a more of a, a lifestyle of freedom. How do I do that? Yes, that's a, I, can, I can definitely uh, help you deploy your money. So it's working hard for you. So you don't have to work very hard. But if you're just starting out and you can barely scrape up enough of that down payment to get your first home, don't buy your buy in the wrong market just for that extra 50 or 100 bucks a month. Uh, I guarantee you that down the road when you're watching all these other markets taking off, like imagine if instead of Vancouver, 10 years ago, you would have bought, I don't know, Yellowknife. And I don't even know what the prices are in Yellowknife. <laughs> but imagine where you'd be right now. Maybe you would have got a little bit more rent relative to purchase price back then, but you certainly would not have captured that appreciation. And that appreciation is what changes your life. Yeah, just like Alberta, I used to sell real estate in Alberta. And it really, the appreciate, you're not playing the appreciation game whatsoever. Yeah, no, especially, especially now, there's going to be a lot of downward pressure. It's important to have the balance though, to have the cash flow at least on the, that break even mark. So no, you're not in negative cash flow. So I appreciate has always been great here in Vancouver, but you're in extreme negative cash flow. So you got to find the, to have the, both, the, be, the places like Mike and us find in the US where uh, you get absolutely. cash flow and appreciation.